Yes. Now, what I'm going to try and impress on you is, is that science is absolutely immersed in philosophy. It used to be called natural philosophy. The word science only started to be used in this technical meaning. It just means knowledge in about 1830. And in fact, we've lost track, particularly in the last 50 years, of the philosophical basis for which any investigation into nature has to take place. Um, a very great English philosopher, I think one of the greatest philosophers of the last hundred and something years, A.N. Whitehead, who partnered Russell in writing the Principia Mathematica in 1911. Whitehead was a mathematician and a physicist and he said that, like all family quarrels, the falling out of science and philosophy has been a disaster for both parties. And I think the word disaster is not too big a claim. What I'm going to talk about is this poisonous topic, the difference between the two brain hemispheres. When I was growing up, there were all kinds of jazzy ideas about what this difference was, that the left hemisphere sort of did reason and language and the right hemisphere did emotion and, you know, it was given to painting pretty pictures. But this is wrong. We soon discovered that both hemispheres were involved in everything. But we'd asked the wrong question of the brain, assuming it, very importantly, assuming it to be a machine rather than part of a person. We'd asked not how does this part of the brain approach the world, but what is it it does, like a photocopier. But the brain is not like that. The brain is how our experience comes into being. I don't necessarily, and I'm not going to address now the question whether consciousness exists apart from the brain. I believe it does. I don't believe the brain actually um, emits consciousness, but if you like, permits consciousness, but I, I'm not going to try and go there today. Um, for those of you who are interested, I've written very long books on all of this, which i tell you about later. But this, there's an observation which goes back many, many years, which is, you find it well summed up by Blaise Pascal in the Pensee, I think 417 in the Brunswick numer numeration, the duplicity or the twofold nature of man is so marked that people have believed that we perhaps have two souls. And remarks like this are also to be found in Spinoza, in Kant, in Goethe, in Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, in Bergson, and in a very great German philosopher, not well known outside of Germany, Max Scheler who, of course, was a brilliant phenomenological philosopher um, who, who died too young, and at his grave, Wittgenstein delivered the oration and said that he was the most brilliant philosopher of his age in Europe. So there's a perception there, and it's not just confined to Western philosophers. I have been reading uh, the anthropology, the mythology of cultures from China, Japan, India, North American native people. And in all these cultures, there is this idea that there's two kinds of aspects to our experience. In fact, the Navajo say that there are two kinds of eyes with which you look at the world. One is to get things and the other is to appreciate the whole, which you will discover in a moment is extremely important. So if you are sceptical about um, the idea that there are important differences between the two brain hemispheres, I can answer in various ways, but I prefer to ask you a few questions. Why is the brain divided? I was never, you know, this was not addressed in medical school. It was just assumed the brain is divided. It has this body of fibres at the base called the corpus callosum, but actually only 2% of fibres cross the corpus callosum, and if the computing power of this machine, the brain, is in connections, why is it severed? And it's not just our brains, all brains that we've looked at, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, when you get down to the neural networks of insects, the most ancient surviving creature, Nematocella vectensis, 700 million years old, 
and described um, by, I think, Thomas Beckstein, uh, who discovered it at Heidelberg. I hope I've got the name right. Uh, he says, this is the origin of the mammalian brain, and it is already asymmetrical. Why? So the first question is, why is it divided? The second is, why is it asymmetrical? I can't show you this, but actually, the brain is much larger at the front, on the right, than on the left, something that was never mentioned in medical school. It's the biggest asymmetry in the brain. What we were told about was that the brain is bigger on the left, posteriorly, because, of course, in those days, the left hemisphere did everything. And the right hemisphere was really just there to prop up the left hemisphere and stop it falling over. But we, we've got beyond that, and in fact, um, the right hemisphere is very important, as I'll try to explain. But in any case, the brain is asymmetrical. Why? Because the skull isn't in the same way, and the world around us is on all sides. And the third question is, this band of fibres, the corpus callosum, it only started with mammals. All the others don't have a connection, or they have very tenuous, exiguous connections, very narrow connections. But the corpus callosum, as such, only started with mammals. And it's got smaller over evolution, not larger. And thirdly, its principal function is inhibition. The brains of the apes have more inhibitory neurons than any other mammals. The brains of humans have more inhibitory neurons and more types of inhibitory neurons than any of the apes. The great advance in the human brain is inhibition. Many of the neurons that cross the corpus callosum are glutamatergic. They are, in other words, um, uh, positive in their effect, if you like. They're transmitting and facilitating. But they, m more often than not, abut on GABAergic neurons, which, of course, are inhibitory. So why is all this? And why is this band of fibres actually getting smaller in relation to the size of the brain? I think the answer is that our brains are becoming more and more specialised in a certain way. And this has an ancient origin. You may well think, what is all this asymmetry about? Well, the answer is really quite simple, I believe. And nobody else has suggested that any other thesis explains more of the data than this thesis. All creatures have to do two things at once which are incompatible. They have to be able to focus extremely precisely on a tiny detail in order to grab it, pick it up, and use it. Food, a twig to build a nest, whatever it is, they've got to be exact, they've got to know exactly what they're looking for, and they've got to be quick and precise in doing it. But if that's the only attention they pay, they will not survive because, at the same time, they have to be looking out for predators, for their conspecifics, for their mate, for their offspring that they need to look after. And so, as one uh, centre of awareness cannot do these two things at once, we need two. We can, you may say, you've done a, 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 an exercise in yoga, which I recommend, which is both simultaneously having the broadest possible open, unjudgmental attention to the whole, and at the same time focusing on a detail. But that's because we have two hemispheres. What I'm interested in is how this affects reality. I mean, this is a really important point. Attention is central to whatever it is that we know as the world we experience. And that's all that we will ever know is the world we experience. It comes into being for us as a product of the way in which attention is paid to the world. And I sometimes give an example of this, which is I live in a house uh, that is at the bottom of a huge mountain, which can be seen from the sea. This is in Scotland. And its name in Norse, which has become naturalized in Scottish, means the sloping rock. Why? Because this mountain was a landmark for the Viking people coming down there that signified very dangerous bay where they were likely to be shipwrecked. We know also from the fact that the Picts, we have their dwellings, the Picts were living there before the Vikings. For them, this mountain was the home of the gods. 
When people came in the 18th century to visit Scotland, they came with their sketchbooks and they drew this mountain for its beautiful texture of many colors and its form. When people came in the 19th century, they were inspired by geology and it just happens to be an extraordinarily good example of columnar basalt formation. Uh, to a physicist, it's 99.99% space of some kind, and the other 0.01%, we don't really know what it is. So which of these is the real mountain? My answer is you can't say any one of them is the real mountain. They're all real ways of appreciating the mountain that come as a product of experience. If you look at an organism as if it were a mechanism, you will find all the bits in that organism that respond to this model. As they say in English, you probably have the same saying, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And this is the problem, that when you look in a certain way, you see only certain things. And that confirms that the way you're looking is good. So you pay more of that kind of attention in future. And so you get tighter and tighter into a spiral that is hard to break out of, in which where you start, believing, for example, that we're dealing only with mechanisms, leads to only mechanical thinking, which misses nine-tenths of the picture. So th this is why it's interesting. What are the differences that occur phenomenologically to someone using their left hemisphere or their right hemisphere? Now, it's quite true that at all the time we're using both from moment to moment. There is a, a meta-control center in the tegmentum of the midbrain, which we think is part of the mechanism that directs attention to one or other hemisphere, but it's constantly changing. But I'm not really talking about that. What I'm talking about ultimately is what happens to an individual or a culture when they either can't or no longer wish to attend to one sort of vision of the world. So on the one hand, you've got the left hemisphere's attention, which produces discrete items, separate, isolated fragments. And these are known because it's looking for what it wants. It's looking for something familiar, food, twig, whatever. The rest it doesn't see. So it's looking for isolated things that are known, that are static. So, for example, when people have damage to the right hemisphere, the normal flow in which you see the world is broken up, and you see a hand moving like... Ju -ju 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 -ju. I'm old enough to remember something called cinefilm. I'm sure none of you here have ever heard of it. But it used to get stuck sometimes, and you get this effect. You could describe it as like stop-go animation. So, because it's fixing something all the time to get it. Um, what it sees is decontextualized, and that is extraordinarily important because context changes everything. It changes the meaning of everything you look at. If you want to understand the heart, you have to look at it in the body where it is situated. If you cut it out and put it on the lab bench, you're not in a better position to understand it. Context can completely change the meaning of a word. Let me give you an example. In America, there are four sizes of cereal packets. There's jumbo, which means very large, and there's economy, which means large. And then there's family, which means medium. And finally, there's large, which means small. So context changes the meaning of everything. One big context that gets omitted is embodiment. So the left hemisphere abstracts information and then categorizes it. So in this process, embodiment and context have been lost, but also the particularity, the unique quality of this thing, because it's treated only as an exemplar of a category. And so it's constantly categorizing the unique, disembodying the embodied. And this process tends towards deanimation. If you, and you can experimentally using TMS, you can knock out one hemisphere at a time. With the left hemisphere, what one normally sees as animate is seen more mechanically. And with the right hemisphere in action and the left hemisphere knocked out, then the world appears more animate. So the sun seems like a living being that is crossing the sky.